Hello everybody, my name is Goran Albanas, I come from Croatia. I'm a psychiatrist uh, and a forensic psychiatrist and psychotherapist and a sex therapist. And first I would like to thank the organizers to give me the opportunity to talk here because I think the most important here, uh, the thing here is that we, the people from different backgrounds, come here and talk about the same topic. And for the survivors of trauma, it is very important that uh, wherever they seek help, they should meet a person who understands their suffering from different levels and from different perspectives. I work in the biggest and the oldest psychiatric hospital in Croatia. It's called Bravce, and it's a common name term. So if you want to offend somebody, you tell them, go to Bravce. We have 881 beds, and as a uh, forensic psychiatrist, I work with offenders of uh, sexual and other types of uh, offenses, and I will talk a little about that perspective. But as a sexual therapist, I also work in an outpatient clinic for sexual problems, so there I meet people with sexual problems, and some of them uh, experienced uh, traumatic uh, events during their lifetime, and we sometimes talk about it and sometimes not, but we have to keep in mind that sexual trauma can be the cause of sexual problems. So I will give you a glimpse of how psychiatrists think about sexual abuse uh, of patients with psychiatric problems and about uh, offenders who do have or don't have psychiatric problems. Well, when we talk about psychiatry, there is a lot of stigma. So there is stigma against patients, but also against medications and staff working in psychiatry. Many research show that lay people, but also professionals, think that patients with psychiatric problems are dangerous, aggressive, unpredictable, and not being able to care of themselves. But the research show that people with mental disorders do not commit more offenses than so-called normal population. So they are not more dangerous than normal population. There is also stigma toward drugs. Many people think that psychiatric drugs uh, produce dependence and change the personality. And in the majority of the cases, this is not the case actually. Only benzodiazepines produce dependence. And benzodiazepines are usually uh, prescribed by GPs. And sometimes people ask for benzodiazepines. Psychiatrists very rarely prescribe benzodiazepines. We usually prescribe antidepressants, antipsychotic drugs, mood stabilizers, and neither of these produce dependence. Also, people who are taking psychiatric drugs often ask, will this drug change my personality? Will I be different in a way? No, these drugs are produced to change, to relieve your suffering, but not to change you as a personality. And finally, there is also stigma towards psychiatrists. Uh, I will tell you, yesterday morning, during the breakfast, the lady who was sitting next to me, she asked me, oh, you are a psychiatrist, are you analyzing all of us at the table? And of course not. I was having a breakfast, and I was trying to have a nice breakfast, not working and analyzing people. So we, the psychiatrists, do not analyze people on, on a daily basis. That's not our job, actually. So first, I will say a few sentences about pe people with psychiatric problems as victims of sexual violence. So there are many research that show that uh, psychiatric patients are more often the victims of domestic violence and also of sexual violence than the general population. And this is especially true for women. Here is one example from, from our hospital. So uh, these are patients from a daycare center, and we found that almost half of the women and uh, one-fifth of the men experienced some kind of violence. Also, 13% of women and less than 1% of men said they had experienced sexual violence. So you can here see this huge gender or sex difference, which is present in the general population, but also in the population of people with psychiatric problems. Men experienced an average two of, of those who did experience, and women 2.7 types of violence, according to their report. But sometimes having a mental disorder can influence the emotional expression of a person. So for that reason, sometimes even mental health professionals can think that these people were not abused, but that they are lying. 
that something which Ruth says, uh, said yesterday, uh, no, sorry, this morning, that many professionals don't believe this has happened. And this can be especially uh, the problem in patients, for example, with uh, schizophrenia. Because the main characteristic of schizophrenia is that your effect, your emotions, do not follow your train of thought. Um, there are two symptoms very specific to, emotional, uh, to emotions, and these are paraphimia and paramimia. In paramimia, you feel one of the feelings, but what you are expressing by your body is totally opposite. So you are, for example, uh, very sad, but you start smiling. So that is a symptom of schizophrenia. In paraphimia, not only that you express differently from what you are feeling, but you also feel something that is different from what people without schizophrenia would have felt. And for that reason, many lay people, but unfortunately many professionals, also think that these people were not abused, because they are not showing what we expect them to, to show. And we have to keep this in mind. This can also happen with people with intellectual incapacities, especially if this intellectual capacity is, a, is of a greater degree. Yesterday and today, we heard about many psychiatric problems that can be the consequences of sexual abuse. And many of you have been talking about post-traumatic stress disorder. But research shows that there are many, others, many other psychiatric problems that can be the result of, um, of sexual abuse. For example, major depression. Probably more victims have major depression than PTSD, especially on a long run. Also, attempted or completed suicide, the risk of these is highly higher than in uh, non-traumatized people. Engaging in high-risk or harmful behaviors, anxiety disorders, sleep disorders, eating disorders, social problems. And when we talk about child abuse, there is also a risk of personality disorders development. That is one thing that Ruth nicely said in the morning, that when we have an adult person with a developed personality, trauma can lead to change of the personality. But when we have a child who, yet, who has not yet developed his or her own personality, then this trauma will integrate into the development of, of a personality. There are many cases when even medical professionals can stigmatize psychiatric patients. I will tell you the two examples which happened to me. Um, in my hospital, I told you it is a huge hospital, so during the night shift there are three psychiatrists working in the hospital. The senior psychiatrist, the medium level psychiatrist and the younger psychiatrist. So this young, the younger psychiatrist is usually in the, uh, in the emergency room. So one night uh, this young psychiatrist called me and she said, uh, here is a woman, and she is a psychiatric patient, she is a schizophrenic patient, and she had been at our institution ten times previously, and now she's telling me that she has been raped. Should I um, hospitalize her? So she was impressed with the schizophrenia, she was impressed by her mental disorder, and she was thinking only medically, should I hospitalize her or not? And I told her, but why are we talking about hospitalization? Shouldn't we inform the police if she was raped? But she was not thinking of that. Because we as medical professionals are not taught to do so. The other example is of a lady who I think has a delusional disorder. This is a lady who came to my office one day and she said, well, I was reading in the newspapers about what you do, you do sexual therapy, and I have sexual problems, and I think I know why I have sexual problems. And I asked her, okay, tell me why do you think you have sexual problems? And she said, so she's now 46, and she said, when I was in my early 20s, uh, and I was a university student, I was raped once in a park near the university. And then I didn't tell anybody about it. A few days later, I told my sister and my brother-in-law about the rape, and I was living with them at the time. And then, several days later, my brother-in-law raped me. Then, after five days, I told this to my sister. And then my sister and I decided to call the police. And then the two police officers came, and they both raped me. So obviously, this rape story is actually the symptom for delusional disorder. She is convinced that she was raped so many times. 
But I think, although she has a delusional disorder that maybe the first rape was real, and actually these new rapes are the symptoms of the delusional disorder, but not the first one. And we should keep that in mind and not disregard her story only because she has a delusional disorder. I also think that, at least in Croatia, legal system can stigmatize psychiatric patients. So in Croatia, which is not the same in all the European countries, but um, the court can send a person for the evaluation of their capacity to stand trial, for example, for perpetrators. For example, if somebody is very psychotic or demented, then maybe he is not, he doesn't have a capacity to, to stand trial. But also in Croatia, the court can send a person, a witness, to be assessed if the person has the capacity of giving a witness report. And in six years, we, we went through the data from 2011 to 2016 in our institution. There were 41 cases when court sent us um, the, the order to assess the person with their capacity of giving a witness report. Interestingly, in 39 of 41 cases, these were the cases, the victims of sexual abuse. Only in two cases, the, these were the victims or witnesses of non-sexual abuses. And what, my question is, why on earth? Why, do, why we don't believe just to people who went through the sexual abuse? Why do we, why we believe to other people, to people who were robbed or, or who were the victims of other crimes? An interesting case from our legal and psychiatric um, uh, perspective. Uh, so this was a case of a woman who was a victim and she also has a certain neurological disorder, and because of this disorder, she behaves in a weird way. So she doesn't have a psychiatric problem, but lay people think that this is a psychiatric problem. She was raped, and this, this, was, um, this was on CD, because the rape happened in the street under surveillance. So everybody could see that she was raped. But although everybody could see that, the court asked us to assess if she has the competency to stand trial. So why on earth? Interestingly, the perpetrator said that he suffers from erectile dysfunction and that he, could, he couldn't have done what he was abused of. And there was also an assessment from a urologist and the urologist said uh, uh, that he is an impotent man and that he could not have done what he has done. Um, research show that almost in half of the cases of rape, uh, the perpetrators do have some erectile problems. So this cannot be uh, the, the, the reason to defend yourself. On the other hand, what do we know about psychiatric patients as sex offenders? So in the same study that we did in the daycare center where we asked people if they had ever uh, experience sex abuse, we also ask them if they have ever committed a sex abuse, and 9% of men said that they committed some kind of violence before, and none of the women. This is an interesting but also expected result. We also did a research on the sex offenders that were sent by the court to our center to assess them, and here are some interesting results. One third of the offenders were drunk at the time of the offense. This is expected. The victim's age were from 2 to 77 of age, so very different range uh, of um, survivors, survivors. In 70% of the cases, the victims uh, knew who the perpetrator was, so only in 30% of the cases this was an unknown person, an unknown man. Half of them were married, half of them had children. Uh, interestingly, 42% of these men repeated classes during their primary or secondary education. Later I will show you that not many of them were intellectually uh, incapacitated, so they are re the repe the repeated, these repeated classes were not due to, to the mental retardation, but due to some other behavioral problems. 40% had earlier convictions, not just sex offenses, but also other uh, offenses. One third of the offenders said they were abused in childhood. 
This is a very high percentage, but also this means that two-thirds of the offenders were not abused, so the majority actually were not abused. 11% of them said they were sexually abused. Here you can see that half of the perpetrators were of the normal intelligence, one quarter were below the, no the normal intelligence, and one quarter were above the normal intelligence. Regarding their psychiatric diagnosis, so what do these people suffer from? Half of them suffer from personality disorders, but personal personality disorders are not really mental disorders, they are not uh, mental disorders in the way other mental disorders are. Personality disorders are more um, personality states because they can be diagnosed at the age of 18 and usually personality disorders stay for the rest of the li their lives. 16% of the these people had substance use disorders. 10%, almost 11% had paraphilias, pedophilia uh, in particular, and 7% had no diagnosis at all. If we look at these personality disorders, people with personality disorders, what kind of personality disorders these were, and in one third of the cases it was antisocial personality disorder. Antisocial personality disorder is a disorder that 20 or 30 years ago we called psychopathy. Now we call it antisocial personality disorder. But interestingly, this is not higher than in perpetrator, perpetrators of other offenses. For example, thieves, people who do theft, Thefts. They also have, one third of them have antisocial personality disorder. Also interestingly, people who evade paying taxes, one third of them have personality, antisocial personality disorder. So this is not specific to sex abusers. One third of them had narcissistic personality disorder, while other personality disorders were less, often 10% dependent, 9% borderline, and 3.6% paranoid personality disorder. Regarding their criminal responsibility, in different countries there are different possibilities of assessing criminal responsibility. In Croatia we have four levels of criminal responsibility. It's very similar to Switzerland or to Germany or to uh, Austria, but it's different from the UK, for example. Uh, so every person after the age of 14 is considered criminally responsible. And during the legal process, we have to, um, to, to give evidence that the person is not criminally responsible. So otherwise, everybody is criminally responsible. And for those who are not, we have on the other end, uh, those who are not guilty by reason of insanity. So these are people who have a certain medical condition, a certain psychiatric disorder that enabled them to either understand what they were doing or to control their behavior. We call this the intellectual capacity to understand and the volitional capacity to control. But there are also two levels of diminished responsibility and in Croatian law they are called severely reduced responsibility and reduced responsibility but not to a severe uh, level. And if the person is not guilty by the reason of insanity then this person is not considered guilty because he was not, he didn't know what he was doing at the time or he was not able to control what he was doing. So he is not sentenced, but he goes to a psychiatric hospital. And only 1.8% of our sex offenders were not guilty by reason of insanity. This is a very, very low percentage. If you are criminally responsible, or if you are of reduced responsibility, but not of a severe, of a severe level, then you go to prison. You, you are sentenced by law. In people with severely reduced responsibility, they also are punished. But adding to that, the court can say you have to be treated because you have a mental disorder. And if you look at the data, 96.5% of our sample were legally responsible, actually, and not mentally disordered people. And my final slide of conclusions. So psychiatric patients, especially women, are often victims of sex offenders. The general population, mental health professionals, legal professionals, and legal system itself stigmatize psychiatric patients. And on the other hand, these people who offend 
are not mentally disturbed. They are malice, they are evil, they are bad people, but they are not mentally disturbed. And we should not equate the malice and the mental disorder. Thank you very much.